The year is 1844, and the rather famous engineer, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, has been tasked with extending the rail network of Great Britain from Exeter down to Plymouth. The problem is, it's really rather hilly in that part of the country, and he's not convinced the steam locomotives of the time are up to the job, so what is he to do? It's time for an atmospheric caper. The National Rail Network had reached Exton in 1844, and there was pressure to extend the line further into the southwest. The issue was that the steam engines of the time were not capable of scaling those hills, so that's where vacuum power came in. Vacuum power trains, or to use the proper term, an atmospheric railway, were somewhat fashionable at the time, with a few experimental lines popping up. Brunel convinced the local railway company to adopt atmospheric power on the basis that it should be able to handle the hills, all for a lower cost than the steam alternative. So how exactly do you power a train via vacuum? Here's our train. In between the rails is a cast iron pipe with an airtight leather seal on the top. At the head of our train you have the piston carriage, so called because the piston that is slung beneath it running inside the pipe. The air is pumped out of the pipe in front of the train, and the piston forms a seal inside of the pipe. However, it's not that the train is sucked along by the vacuum, it's actually pushed along by atmospheric pressure. As the train moves along the track and the piston moves through its pipe, two small wheels behind the piston head push open the seal on top of the pipe. This seal is a series of leather flaps reinforced by iron that are hinged on one side. As these are opened, air rushes in and pushes on the rear side of the piston head, propelling the train along. The flap then falls back down and is pressed firmly back in place by a trailing wheel, to preserve the airtight seal. The air was pumped out of the pipe ahead of the trains by steam-powered pumping stations, positioned about one every three miles. This system had some significant benefits. Other examples of atmospheric railways had proven themselves capable of tackling severe inclines, so the hills west of Exeter would no longer present an insurmountable barrier. The track itself could be made without as much structural reinforcement, as the train itself had no heavy engines, nor need to carry coal or water, so it was significantly lighter. This also made the train more efficient, as without all that weight, less energy would be needed to move it. A steam-powered locomotive is also rather loud, and it kicks out a lot of smoke, which can make riding on one or living near a line serviced by them a somewhat unpleasant prospect. The unusual power generation for the atmospheric railway meant that the train itself was not in control of its own power generation. That was entirely in the hands of the pump stations along the line. There was no ability to throttle back the engine. Your train was being pushed along, and that force was there whether you wanted it or not. The only control the trains had was the ability to use its brakes. You were either braking and slowing down, or doing nothing and being powered forward. This did lead to a few station overruns, but in the end it wasn't a major issue, just a little odd. However, as you may have imagined, there were some significant drawbacks to this system. Whilst the atmospheric railway could deal with reasonable gradients, it wasn't a miracle worker, so to try and lessen the inclines, the track took a coastal route for the 20 mile section from Exeter to Newton Abbott. This meant that it was in close proximity to the sea, and the salt in the air was not kind to the pipe's workings. Both hot and cold temperatures would cause the leather flap to crack, so lime soap was initially used to lubricate and seal the flap. When the soap hardened and became ineffective, it was replaced with animal fat, which then attracted rats who ate the fat, along with parts of the leather seal. The line's supposed cost-saving benefits were also severely diminished by inefficient running of the pump houses. Telegraphs were installed in the stations, but not the pump houses themselves, so the pumps were operated to a schedule, regardless of whether the train had been held up or not. Without communication, they had to run constantly, wasting coal until the train finally passed. Despite all these issues, they managed to run the trains on time, but they could not keep them anywhere close to within budget. The seal itself had worn out, amongst a few other things, and the cost to repair the section of track that had been built was simply too high. Steam engines, once deemed unable to cope with the steep gradients, were in reality coping just fine, so the decision was made to remove the atmospheric infrastructure to make way for standard steam locomotives. The first passengers to ride on the atmospheric railway did so on the 13th of September 1847, and the last journey was made on the 5th of September the following year. 
In the year of its public operation, only the section between Exeter and Newton Abbott was actually completed, but that alone cost £420,000. Adjusted for inflation, that figure now amounts to over £50 million. Despite the atmospheric caper having come to an end 170 years ago, there are a few traces of its existence left. A few of the pump houses remain, although they've been repurposed. A reservoir for the steam-powered vacuum pump at the turf section still remains. The track itself bears a few reminders, with inclines and curves that are a little more severe than is standard, and it still follows more or less the same route. The Devon village of Starcross, with its repurposed pump house, even has a pub called the Atmospheric Railway. The Atmospheric Railway was a short-lived experiment, but it was an interesting one, and proof that for every winning idea, there are always some that don't quite hit the mark. A big thank you to the Newton Abbey Museum for access to their section of the Atmospheric Railway Pipe.